Attention bobsled riders, you will soon be embarking on a thrilling podcast down the icy slopes of the Matterhorn, so please remain seated keeping your hands, arms, feet and legs inside the bobsled at all times. Auf Wiedersehen! Hello Yodelers! We are the Matterhorn Yodelers, I am your host today, Peter, with my other host... Jacket and Jeepers. And today we're going back again. <laughs> we're going back. Yodelers! We're going back! <laughs> Sorry, we're going back to the past here. Um recently I was thinking, you know, me and my Disney nerd self was thinking like, you know what, we can talk about the nineteen sixty four sixty five World's Fair. Let me ask my yodelers here. What did you guys really know about the 1964-65 World's Fair prior to prepping for this episode? I did. You go. It existed. <laughs> Disney had some attractions there. That was it. And that that's about the extent that I knew is that some of the attractions, I knew Small World, and I knew Carousel of Progress mm -hmm. was an attraction that was seen in at World Fair. I didn't know that there was one World Fair that really um, showcased Walt and the company. Yeah, I didn't realize that like all of the like attractions that I knew that were part of the World Fair were in the same year World yes. Fair. Even when we were discussing this podcast, I was like, oh, they're different years. And then I was like, oh no, there we are. <laughs> yep. So, like, it's it's really interesting about how this all came about. So, basically, New York, they were like, okay, we want to do another World's Fair. They had just done one in the 30s, and they wanted to do another one so that they could uh, hopefully get enough funding to build their park. Um, and so they, they wanted to do the World's Fair in 1964-65. Uh, but the, the person who was in charge of it, he, he didn't want the cheapy attractions that were in the, in the garbage shows uh, that were in prior World's Fair, like the, the girl, the dancing girls or uh, the, the like little a showcase. kitty rides. Yeah. Like he, he wanted like... Eiffel Tower level. Yeah, he wanted, he, put, he wanted to put on a spectacle. So he came to none other than Walt Disney to be like, hey, I want to work with you on this. And so Walt Disney at the time was working on several attractions. And so Walt saw this as an opportunity to be like, well, I can work on these attractions and get other people to pay my bill for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. And as I'm going through, like, research these rides, these sponsorships that help create these rides, it was, it was brilliant. Like, oh, I'll give you... I'll let you put your name all over this attraction if you help me like pay for oh, developing yeah. it and it really worked out like you know and you know it was good for Walt because they don't do it anymore nope, nope. meaning the company well, didn't make their money off and of that, it. that was the thing so like if you look at the World's Fair as a whole it was a failure like attendance was low they didn't get their money they had tons of debt the people like it was it was run very poorly uh, but for Walt it was the exact opposite it was the best thing it literally moved Walt Disney to the next step in his company's progression like Disneyland had just been opened and at that point uh, it was starting to run on itself like it wasn't running by Walt anymore. It was just functioning on its own at this point. And so Walt was trying to figure out what he needed to do. He was getting a lot of pressure to build a theme park on the East Coast, but he wasn't sure if the he wasn't sure if the East Coast audience would be too sophisticated for a Disney park. And so when presented this opportunity, and he, and he put it in no. <laughs> <laughs> and so when presented this opportunity, while he was working on several attractions, many of which we will talk about today, um, uh, you know, he saw this as an opportunity to test the audience on the East Coast. Um, because 
we on the West Coast have a sophisticated ability to understand the NISO rides. No, 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 no. <laughs> the West Coast was not as sophisticated uh, as the East Coast. That was uh, what that okay. was what Walt's worry was. And so this was a way to test that. So uh, at the time, I'll talk about a couple of the attractions here. One, he was working on the Tiki Room at the time. And so that yeah. was one that he was trying to get a company to sponsor for the World's Fair. He went to Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was initially interested and then backed off. Wasn't it the Hawaiian airline? It was an airline that sponsored it. Uh, in the theme park, yes. Okay. So the Tiki Room never actually made it to the World's Fair, but the, the Hawaiian Airlines did eventually sponsor it when it was built in the theme park. I learned itself. that from a guest when I was working in the Tiki Room. He asked me, like, oh, who sponsored it? You, when you worked at a theme park, you have random people come up to you <laughs> yes. and be like, did you know? And you would be like, yes. <laughs> oh, the Haunted Mansion was the worst. So like, uh, yes. Oh, did you know? No, that's not true. Well, I heard, no, it's not, I would even interrupt them before they finish. No, that's not true. <laughs> Try again later. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, very true. <laughs> very true. That, that that does happen a lot as a cast member. Guests try to, like, one-up on a cast member, and it's like, okay, dude, like, get on the right. <laughs> Seatbelt. <laughs> this is right. a haunted man shit. Seatbelt. Seat <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> Over your mouth. Seatbelt <laughs> over your mouth. That's where your seatbelt needs to go. So, getting back on track. So, that was one attraction Walt was working on, but it did not make it to the World's Fair. One attraction that did make it to the World's Fair, uh, but we're not going to really go into too much detail about, uh, it probably deserves its own episode, um, is uh, the Hall of Presidents show that he wanted to do. He actually went to Ford to sponsor the attraction first. Ford said no, they wanted to do something more about their brand and not just about presidents. Uh, eventually the show, there was a lot of- companies. Nothing sells Ford than a bunch of like old white guys <laughs> who stand up going, I was a president. <laughs> Pretty much. By Ford. <laughs> and due to a bunch of complications with the animatronic that was reduced just to one president, which was Abraham Lincoln. And eventually they got the, uh, the Illinois Pavilion to sponsor great moments with Mr. Lincoln. Um, but today we're going to talk about three other attractions. The three other attractions, there were four. Great moments with Mr. Lincoln was one. We're going to talk about the other three attractions that happened at the World's Fair uh, th and their influence on the parks today. So I'm going to talk about mine, which was the Ford... Uh, Magic <coughs> Skyway. The so as I mentioned before, Disney wanted to do a pavilion with Ford, um, but uh, they wanted to do the Walt Disney wanted to do the Lincoln. They said no, so they started coming with other plans. One of the plans that they came up with was a plan to kind of have a, a driving across America ride, where you're in a vehicle. And you're driving through different scenes of America. So it's test track. Test track, correct. Basically. Now sponsored by GM. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, so that went far until Chevy released their slogan or whatever, which was like, drive across America. Oh, no. Which at that time Ford was all like, eh, scrap that. We're not doing that anymore. <laughs> So Walt Disney had to come up with another idea. And so they came up with this attraction about traveling through uh, the history of... Automotive history? Automotive history-ish, sort of. Okay. Um, it's very incomplete, you could say. Like, it, it, goes, it goes all the way back. Well, I'll get to that. Um, so the pavilion opened. As you enter the pavilion, you're in this big queue downstairs. So it was a two level pavilion. The attraction was upstairs. On the ground floor it was a queue. They had a bunch of cars there um, showing off their, their new vehicles. And they also had dioramas of places from around the world. Why? <laughs> I don't know. They just did. It's Ford. <laughs> it just you know what like, this needs? Diorama of Japan. Here's a, here's, a, here's a fishing village in Vietnam. 
okay. Uh, all right. Like, that's needed in the Ford Pavilion. Sure. Uh, so eventually, after you get to the queue, you go upstairs and you get into a vehicle. They had a variety of different vehicles. Actually, before I get to the vehicle, before as they were making the attraction, uh, Walt Disney and some of the uh, people that he worked with went to the Ford uh, factory um, and saw how they made vehicles so that they could get ideas. And they saw how the they saw the production line and how the vehicles assembly line. the assembly line, and that's what inspired them to be like, we can kind of turn this into the way the attraction works, how it moves, uh, which um, it was a very unique ride system never before created um, until this attraction, which I'll, I'll get into because um, it inspired another very popular attraction uh, still around today. So I never get, read that. I never rode that ride. Yes, you have. Still around the world. No, I'm just oh. being <laughs> smart. <laughs> Uh, so uh, you get into a vehicle. There were a variety of different Ford vehicles. The one that was everyone wanted to get into was the new 1964 Mustang. Oh yeah, Ford Mustang. That's right. That was, that was their op a lot of people's opportunity to sit in these nice Ford vehicles um, for that time period, and so it was a great opportunity there. So there, you went on this. Uh, you start off and you're in this like kind of glass tunnel and you're hearing the president of the Ford company talking about the attraction that was made by Walt Disney and all that stuff kind of giving you a heads up of what you're about to experience and then you get taken back in time all the way back to the time of dinosaurs and you get to see how uh, papers made <laughs> now like where oil where and, oil yeah. basi where we're, we have oil to have functioning vehicles. Basically, <laughs> that's kind of the point of showing off dinosaurs. Um, and you saw a variety of different dinosaurs. Um, and then, as you progress to the ride, you get to man, to the caveman, and things like that. So you see the cavemen with cave drawings of them. They had a big. It's like a spaceship Earth. There's a connection. Ah. Yes. So I could smell the burning of Rome. <laughs> that's right. It was burning Rome. Now, so like you see the cavemen. There's a scene where they're like killing a woolly mammoth in a tar pit okay. scene. Like, oh yeah, it's, it's a pretty graphic scene there. Uh, but goofy faces, uh, very Mark Davis style of uh, design. You can definitely tell this had Mark Davis all over it. Those are no Mark Davis. He's one of like the Imagineers for uh, Haunted Mansion and Pirates. Pirates, mm -hmm. yes. Or that that group of Imagineers. Yes. So, uh, and then from there, uh, you you find the caveman who who invented the wheel, and these are all animatronics, so they're all moving and they're all making noises and things like that. And it's kind of funny, like they have like this scene like of him like. Figuring out that how the wheel works, and then he has this funny scene where like he's standing in the back of this like wagon, waving at his friends, <laughs> and his wife is carrying her their kid on their back, and she's pulling the cart, and she's all like <laughs> giving him like this dirty scowl, like, Arr. and he's like, ah, ah, <laughs> waving to his friends, and then you get taken to this kind of like transition where you see the wheels progress through time, this animation of just different wheels, to you get to overlook a city of the future, of how the city and vehicles are moving all around you, you're looking down, and then you get taken off, and it's then... An anti-people mover city? Sort of, <laughs> yes. And so then eventually the ride ends, you get out, and then there's a whole display of other Ford vehicles. So that's, so a lot of you might go, well, that doesn't sound like anything we have today. Um, well, it sounds like Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It sounds like most Western states, <laughs> the grid system of cars and yes. streets and very yes. little uh, public transportation. Pretty much. Uh, so basically, at the end of the World's Fair, Walt Disney had success with the other companies saying, hey, we want to bring these over to the theme parks. 
They thought they could do the same thing with the Ford Skyway, but with different vehicles, not with Mustangs and other Ford vehicles, but another vehicle uh, known as the People Mover. Um, and Ford said, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so Walt Disney said, oh, okay. So he took his dinosaurs and went home. So he literally took the dinosaurs from the attraction, put them into Disneyland, and you might ask yourself, where are there dinosaurs in Disneyland? There's the prehistoric diorama and that uh, in between Tomorrowland train station and the Main Street main yeah, station. Yeah, you discussed this with your... Claude your, Coates. Yeah, with, mm -hmm. the, with the Windows episode yes. we did. Correct. Claude Coates was a big part of the attraction as well. He was a big Imagineer at that time. Go back to our Windows on Main Street episode to know more about Claude Coates. Yeah, he's a pretty cool dude. He's got two windows. That's right. He's, well, he's got more than two windows because he's got one at Disney World. Yeah, but, but I'm, I'm referring well, to Well, at Disneyland. Disneyland, yeah, he's got two. Big so, deal. He's a big deal. So, uh, so yeah, so you can actually still see remnants of this attraction at Disneyland today in the uh, prehistoric diorama that you, uh, you can only see from the Tomorrowland train station. Yeah, it's always that weird as you're riding the train and you're just all like, <laughs> I'm looking at dinosaurs now? <laughs> all yeah, right. I, just, I can just imagine Walt getting the rejection of like, no, and he just grabs his dinosaurs <laughs> and storming out the door. <laughs> you're a poopy head. No, you are. I think it's, I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> it's funny, though, because there is video footage of them transporting these dinosaurs Across road. highways, it was across Queens, the nation. It was in Queens, New York. Yeah, it was in Queens, New York. So they had to travel all the way back to Burbank to be fixed up, and then to Anaheim mm -hmm. to clean off all Disneyland. the bugs that were. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I can't drive to Los Angeles without it and all those butterflies. Pretty stuff. much. So, uh, so that is the remnants of the uh, the Ford Magic Skyway attraction. The building's all gone now, um, but we still have remnants of its impact today. So as I mentioned, Walt Disney wanted to introduce a new vehicle at Disneyland and use this attraction called the People Mover. At Disney World, people recognize this because it is a very popular attraction. Oh, love it. Uh, oh, it's great. It's the same sort of ride vehicle that just, it, it, it works really well. It's always moving and it's a really good with guest flow. It also helped inspire the technology behind the Omnimover system for Haunted Mansion and all those other. No, yeah, Haunted Mansion and uh, you, you got know, Buzz Lightyear. Buzz Lightyear's on it. Little Mermaid. Uh, Spaceship Fight. Earth. Yes, all of those attractions that have that Omnimover system uh, kind of got its idea from this attraction itself. Um, now, going a little bit forward in time, in, with the construction of Epcot, uh, Disney wanted to make another deal with Ford and say, hey, we, we want to build this automotive pavilion in our Epcot Center uh, Park, and we want you to be a part of it. And Ford said, no. <laughs> um, and so they went to uh, GM. And you see it's definitely a plussed up version of the same attraction where you actually go through more history than just dinosaurs and cavemen you you go from cavemen to the wet old west and automotive vehicles like it's a full-fledged attraction it's a really good attraction i recommend anyone to go online watch the old ride throughs of the world of motion attraction um, which then, as it ends, it ends to a giant plaza full of general motor vehicles. So very similar to the Ford Magic Way ended as well. Um, yeah, and, uh, and also uh, the ending to the Ford, last note, the ending to the Ford Magic Skyway ride ended with the looking over to a futuristic city which was something Walt was actually working on at the time but wasn't ready to announce was his plans to build a experimental prototype community of tomorrow. And so that was kind of like a sneak peek as to what Walt was working on uh, behind the scenes. That's uh, funny because he did the same thing at Carousel oh, Progress. Yeah. He was 
Like, well, well, why not double dip? Yeah. You know? Basically, like I was re-watching this documentary where it talked about like, you know, with Disneyland operating on itself, he was trying to look at to his legacy. And so that's when he started working. I'm on sure he also that. has the diagnosis or he's like, he could feel, I mean, it's 64, 65, he's, I think, is it 66 well, or 67 that he passed? 67 away. is when he passed. So, I mean, you have like three years and I imagine well, you that feel was, his well, he was health started. is deteriorating as well. I mean, you could just feel like, hey, let's, you know, you get to a certain age and you want to share what you know or to make the world better based on all your experiences and it. You know, maybe you just said that, hey, this is the time to flip it on. Correct. And, and you you know, you see the way the Walt handled the World's Fair, and you definitely see connections on how they designed Epcot Center. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to, it's it was designed to be a permanent World's Fair. So uh, that's what I have on my Ford, uh, Ford Magic Way Skyway Tour attraction. Uh, Jay Fifth, why don't you tell us about the attraction you kind of did research on? I worked on the Carousel of Progress. And so you're like, the origins of it actually begin before we went to this World Fair. Um, originally, General Electric um, and Disney were partnering in the late 50s to have this kind of attraction show. It wasn't a ride, but it was kind of a walkthrough. And it was going to be a new kind of square or part, like how we have New Orleans Square. They were going to have an Edison Square at Disneyland. So Edison Square was going to be a kind of a hub between Tomorrowland and Main Street, where the Plaza Inn restaurant is. Okay. So you wouldn't have it there, and it kind of would go back there where you have like the parking lot for the cast members or whatever. Um, and it was going to be just right above where they're going to have an addition there, which was going to be Liberty Street. Mm -hmm. So you know where you go to drop off, like you're, you got the uh, the lockers. Mm -hmm. So that was going to be a street for Liberty Square, or I think that's what it was, Liberty Street. And then just north of it, you wouldn't be able to access it. You would have Edison Square. I think that's what I saw on the map. I think Edison Square is where that street is, the, where the lockers are now. Actually, no, it was Edison Street was I thought, I thought it was going to curve down. Was it? And okay. then Liberty Street was just below where it was. Oh, okay. And so, uh, yeah, like uh, it was going to be in between Tomorrowland and Main Street in that little area yes. where you go to the bathroom. Okay. That little spot. And so it was also gonna, so Edison Street was going to be kind of a hub that continued with like the theming of, of Main Street, but. Um, it was going to have a roundabout, and that's where the horse carriages would stop, and you would just have the automobiles would have another place to go around. And um, But the attraction was going to have, like, four rooms, similar to the Carousel of Progress, where they show different progressions of, of uh, electricity and GM products, harnessing, and... What was gonna, the attraction was going to be called Harnessing the Lightning. It sounds like yes. a Metallica song. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a Harness great Harnessing the name. Lightning. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think Disney should hold on to that for a future like oh. roller coaster ride. Oh, like, yeah. That is a Harnessing the, the Lightning. Yeah, like, like a Hercules theme ride or a Zeus theme ride. I think Metallica stole it. They have like Ride the Lightning, but Disney's <laughs> like, you know what? We're going to harness <laughs> the lightning. <laughs> <laughs> So this was actually really close reality where they were yeah. putting it on maps and I was going through online, they had this pamphlet and I'm horrible with sourcing, I didn't write it down. I think I did this at like 10 or 11 o'clock and I'm doing my research and I'm just flipping through this, but they had like a 40 page notebook of what was gonna happen. It was illustrated, it was ready to be put out there. And then GE's like, Bloop! they pulled the plug and they're like, we're not doing this. Yep. Mm. And so Disney's like, all right. but GE knew that the World Fair was coming to New York in '64, and they're like, you know what? Let's put this together, and so uh, let's do this here, and we'll go from there, because GE wanted to have their influence. I mean, the World Fair, you have people from different countries, different, you know, the U.S. states, the biggest companies showcase their stuff it was kind of like what is the the tech one that they have the uh what's the name for it? the oh. e3 well that's the video game one. that's the video um. game one but there's there's like where all the electronic companies get together and they showcase everything you know but that was what we did 
before you had the internet, the companies were like, this is where it's going down. Yeah. This is where we're going, and you want to buy into our stocks. I mean, this was huge it was promotional. Absolutely. This was definitely a marketing tool for companies, countries, and states to show off what makes them great. Yeah, and so General Electric, they said, we're going to have a pavilion, and it, it's a building, and it's like a ride. They basically were going to have a ride, and it was called Progress Land. And so uh, Imagineer John Hench was inspired uh, by a Broadway production of Our Town in which the father figure narrates the story through several generations. And if you've been on the Carousel of Progress, that's what you're getting. You're getting the same narration, mm -hmm. a father in different time periods. And so uh, the show took place, function as a giant donut. So you get in there and you sit in your seat and you're the this donut moves from scene to scene and it takes place in the 1890s, the 1920s, the 1940s, and the swinging 60s. Um, if you've been on the ride recently, it's not like that. Um, you get more modern 1980s laser disc and, right. <laughs> and these big giant headsets and like, that's VR! And like, they were futuristic that way. We do yes. have the Oculus Rift kind of VR. Um, but it's still very hokey 1980s uh, future. <laughs> oh, yeah. Carousel of Progress of 1980s, which is appropriate for our Tomorrowland, uh, the jabs that I like to do. And so they had this, and so the, like I said, the center stage, and you have 32 animatronics. And this is, like Peter was saying, um, Tiki Room was like, hey, we can do animatronics. We have yes. computers, and then they can all do their parts. And um, I mean, these computers are very uh, minimal <laughs> compared to what computers can do now. But um, to the point where they were going to do human beings, it wasn't done. They did birds. Now we're going to do human beings moving and talking, and and it's it's a show. It's a play. And, and and throughout this play, you see different, you see the progression of the harnessing of electricity, really, of how GE has built these um, appliances that are influencing our life and progressing us through time. And of course, they get you to the 60s to show you, like, this is what it is now or what we're going to be like. And, and they, they don't go too far. I mean, they're not going like, this is what the 80s are going to be like. And I'm like, we're up in space. And I mean, this is 64. We're, you know... Kennedy's just given the speech like, hey, we're, we're going to the moon. And we're like, okay, Kennedy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> hey, this guy over here. Um, and so, the, you know, the attraction had, like I said, 32 animatronics. That was, that they were building this at the time. And, and, and he may have been motivated by um, the Ford plants and seeing how it put together because they learned, okay, with the human parts we need to build the same parts and like have it be able to change in and out like hey we need to fix this we can pull from different animatronics because they're all built with the same parts and make it easy kind of like a lot of cars today where you know they got the same frame like i drive a frontier but i can buy, get parts for like the pathfinder and then the xterra you know just because it's all the same it just has a different shell on top and that's what i think walt probably learned when they were doing like the, the Imagineers, like, hey, well, you need to use the same parts. This is going to be really expensive. And so, I mean, there was growth and learning with this groundbreaking animatronics. So, as we know, like, this leads to other attractions at Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean. This is groundbreaking, um, you know, progress for the company. And, and I mean, just think it's the 60s that you're seeing animatronic human beings singing and talking to you. That's really cool. Yeah. You know, now we're just like, we're just cool and we see like a, a self-walking robot dog and then we're all like, <laughs> they're going to kill us, you know, back then. <laughs> these people are just seeing human beings. They're like, oh, wow, we're going to be able to tell the difference between humans and these animatronic robots? Well, it's kind of funny, a side story about the uh, production of Great Moments of Mr. Lincoln was that like they thought Mr. Lincoln was a real person. Oh yeah, like the way they made him because they they molded his face off of his own death, his death mask. mask, yeah, and and so like they made him look just like him. And a funny story is that there was at one point during one of the test showings to 
the people funding it. Um, w- one of the uh, one of the the hoses broke. Don't the use red, hydraulic fluid. You don't use the red hydraulic <laughs> fluid. He used red hydraulic fluid, and so it looked like he got shot. And so everyone so people were all like, "Oh, you even recreated his assassination!" Oh and so they're like, gosh. "Okay, we need to change this." Oh, that's the running joke. <laughs> like you don't use red hydraulic fluid <laughs> at great moments in Mitchell Lincoln. So sad. Yeah, because at that point, where the hydraulic fluid is missing, you just see him go down. <laughs> yeah, and he just like slumps over, and you're just like, "This is dark." <laughs> I do not want to relive this. <laughs> New definition of dark ride. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I said, with animatronics, this is groundbreaking. It's not been in the parks, and it's being shown here at this World Fair, and it's it finds success. I mean, there is, um, and also you have a great theme song composed by who? Dick and Bob Sherman, you know, the classic you know, the, mm-hmm. <laughs> songwriters, songwriters, yeah. they, you know, and it's, it's the song is, uh, there's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. And boy, it sticks in your head. It's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. Yep. Just a dream away. It was, it was, was a bad. I cannot. Yeah, well, that was, I did pretty good. good. Did pretty now it's good. stuck in your head forever. Once you've been on the ride and they sing it over and over to you and you can't get it out. And and they actually wrote that song in tribute to Walt Disney. It was written mm-hmm. as if it was Walt Disney's theme song. It really is. Aww. Like, if you listen to the I words, man the has a dream. I got a little goosebumps. <laughs> man has a dream, and that's the start. He follows his dreams with mind and heart, and then it becomes a reality. It's literally Walt Aww. Disney's theme song. And I love Oh, I go to Disney World. I love riding that ride. Even people are with us, it's like, oh, we're really going to ride this? And I was like, I love it. I just get. I feel good, and that was kind of the theming that they were going it's for. He's good. <laughs> it is, and I mean, there were great things that came from this. Um, um, we got for the first time the wait time because the line was so backed up and it was muddling up things. They had to do the classic cube, but they knew how long it was going to take because it's a time show and you can fit so many people. And so mm-hmm. at this point, you're going to get five minutes. 10 minutes and so they've added for the first time a wait time to a queue wow. and so that was one of the contributions to this is the classic wait time <laughs> oh we got you have five minutes you know <laughs> <laughs> all thanks to carousel progress which probably today does not have a wait there's time. not a wait time ever for it when's it start well the show starts in two minutes so you got two minutes from this point <laughs> um you know, so this was all on the first floor, and then on the second floor of the Progress, you had, it was kind of like a dome shape, so they had, um, they they took advantage of the concave ceiling and provided, like, dazzling sequences of thunder and lightning, solar flares, and spinning atoms, like, just kind of just the future, and kind of that, you could just think of the sci-fi, oh, yeah. kind of, like, hokey, black and white, uh, kind of cartoonish, I, that's what I envision when I see it, and... Also, you got to see um, a general uh, electric nuclear fusion demonstration. And I think of, like, Tony Stark's dad and, like, oh. that big city. And it's like, well, where do you think it's inspired that, that's from? That's literally what, yeah. Like, they basically painted uh, uh, Howard Stark as Walt Disney in Iron Man 2 yeah. with that whole setup with the this uh, Stark Expo and... All of that, that that is literally like, they're literally mimicking Walt Disney at the time when Walt Disney just bought Marvel. Hmm. Mm. Coincidence? And there was a theme song (laughs) written uh, for the Stark Expo, written by, hmm, a Sherman brother? Really, the Sherman brother? Oh my goodness. He wrote the theme song to the Stark Expo. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's a good, uh, good little tip right there. And also, finally, as Peter has mentioned before, um, Progress Land um, also displayed Walt's vision of the future with a, a city, you know, is what we know as Epcot that he loved showing and, and people got to see it and um, kind of that uh, vision for the city, like it's some city. Remember you, had, you wanted to get that, that high density kind of futuristic city? And you wanted to put it in, in your SimCity kind of set town. 
that's what they were trying to move towards. So there's that trend of the 40s and of the architects going, hey, we need to live in high density and kind of preserve Earth and we kind of work here, but we play out here. And, and so uh, that was, you know, what they were going towards. And, and so after the ride, you know, it moves to Disneyland. You know, it, it, it gets stationed there right next to Space Mountain as as Tomorrowland is growing. So I'm sorry, Edison Square did not come to oh. fruition. Um, Sounded cool, though. It, it does. It's Edison Square. And it, and it goes along with the theme with Walt and his patrons and, and, and the American Dream. And we'll get into this in the next episode of uh, podcast. So just, you know, Walt admired the great thinker and 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 people who are looking to the future and progressing and inventing new things. And Thomas Edison was one of those people. And Thomas Edison's company later evolves into General Electric. And so there is kind of that respect towards, you know, as a um, fellow capitalist and growing of companies, you know, he was kind of probably one of his people he looked to and go, okay, what, what are they doing? Or how do they do things? And, um, and, and plus, I mean, Thomas Edison, you know, brought us, you know, we're in the early industrial age, but really brought us into the electrical, you know, age. And it's, it's exciting. And so I can totally see why he wanted to incorporate into his Main Street ideas. Like, yeah, this is old Main Street, but like, boom, it was electricity that started getting America on absolutely. the world stage it of did. like, yeah. It absolutely did. Um, after Disneyland 67, uh, after Disneyland, um, Hall of Presidents, not Hall of Presidents, Carousel of Progress moves to Magic Kingdom in 1975, about the time when Space Mountain opens up, around that time period. Um, just kind of that renovation of Tomorrowland. And uh, it is, Carousel of Progress is the oldest attraction at Walt Disney World to have been touched by Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. So you want to feel the presence of, of Walt Ride to Carousel of Progress. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's there. Um, and there's some things, these, and I'm stealing these lines because um, they're those kind of feel goods. Um, I don't know who wrote them, but I heard them and I was like, i got to say them. They're so good. Walt Disney, you know, with this ride in an era filled with fear and atomic warfare and the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is around this time period, just two years before, Walt's optimistic outlook embodied by the Carousel of Progress gave people hope for the future you know never though did one american's greatest storytellers forget that for any great society to forge ahead it must first understand its past and that just totally embodies the idea of carousel progress not once was there a nuclear bomb going off and like sirens going off and like hide underneath the desk <laughs> it's a great big beautiful <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> and so that's what's just great. I it's just a good feel good attraction that I feel still holds up even though it's just not appreciated. And if you just want that theme song stuck in your head, it's a good one, I think. I say that until it's like two days later and you're like, Please stop <laughs> <laughs> And uh yeah, that's all I've got for the carousel program. So there's one more, no at least one more note that that came to my mind. If you ride the People Mover at Magic Kingdom, yeah, you can actually you can see the progress. You move by Progress City. The I, I don't think it's the same model, but I'm sure it's a replica yeah. of the model that was used during the World's Fair. I think the one that, that you pavilion. see is the one that Walt. It was used on the television show. That. Sounds and right. and when Walt passed away, they were just like, okay, we they were just they completed it. They're like, we have to finish this. This is what Walt was working in his vision. I don't think it was fully complete. The one that you you see, and so yeah. yeah. And then, obviously, there was a successor attraction that happened later on in the eighties at Epcot called Horizons. People call it the Carousel's Progress is. Uh, the, the next chapter of yeah. the story. Almost. And you'll get those diehard people. When I oh, worked yeah. at Mission Space, you're like, bring her back! And I'm all like, you know, orange side or green side? Because that's what you ask people when they get on the ride. Like, I totally blew that off. I was like, no, sorry. Not indulging this. Wow. 
What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, thank you. Wait there or manos, más o menos. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> just in case. <laughs> So thank you for sharing about the the Carousel of Progress or Progress City. Um, Jackie, why don't you tell us the last attraction that they worked on? Well, while we're on the subject of annoying songs, let's go to It's a Small World. It's a Small World. So I love that song. This doesn't bother me. The, you know, like the song, it goes through these cycles where you like when you first listen to it, you're like whatever, and then you go to hate it. Because you're like, oh, this song is so annoying. And then as it gets continually stuck in your head and you can't get it out, you eventually go numb to it. And as you go numb to it, you learn to appreciate it and it becomes your favorite song. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind it. No, it doesn't bother me. So, Small World was a little bit different with sponsors. So... This is a funny story. Yeah, so <laughs> Pepsi goes to web industry, right? Or web. Is it wed? Wed. Wed. Okay. WD. Yes. Yeah. Web. Web, web is the new, uh, <laughs> new Spider-Man attraction <laughs> at California Adventure. Uh, so Pepsi goes to Web and is all like, "Hey, we want you to do one of our. Uh, we want to sponsor a sponsor for our pavilion. For our pavilion. And uh, this was a year before the World's Fair. Oh boy. Yeah." And uh, the person over Wed was like, no. no. <laughs> and That's uh, cute. <laughs> yeah. Walt Disney found out, was furious, and went to Pepsi and goes, we accept the challenge. <laughs> Give us money. <laughs> Um, which under I now understanding hearing your guys' story, they had so many like rejections and like read things and you want a, a company's coming to you and they want to like... Well, I mean, how often are you going to get a company come to you and say, hey, we're going to give you all this money to make a ride that you don't have to pay for? Of course, like, you'd have to be dumb to pass Yeah, that. the project managers were like, I don't want any more stuff. <laughs> That's what the project was like, I want to eat dinner with my family. <laughs> and Walt's like, I don't care. <laughs> I want you to pay for my ride. Right. <laughs> Never ask the project manager if he has time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, it's like, yes, we're going to do it. They were on a very short time frame <laughs> to least. come up with a concept. And they didn't have a big budget. Nope. Well, if you look at the ride, it doesn't look <laughs> like it had a big budget. Um, so the, uh, the pavilion was going to be... Children of the World was the original name, uh, but they changed it to it's, it's a Small World because of the song. Um, it was the fair, let's see here, opened April 22nd, 1964. It's a Small World was a success. It cost 95 cents for an adult and 60 cents for a child. That's a lot of money back then. Yeah. I mean, we just watched the Sandlot, and they, for like 90 cents, they got a baseball. Yeah. So how much would a baseball cost today? It would be like 10 bucks. So you're paying 10 bucks to ride Small World. Boy, that would be a hard sell for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, this also, um, they, a lot of the funds went to UNICEF, which was the... UN's, like... Humanitarian. Uh, yes, which um, was also a part sponsorship of the pavilion. That's why they involved children in the pavilion. Um, so it was, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of money, and so they had to pull a lot of Imagineers' creativity. Um, I feel like this is like the scene in Apollo 13 where they're like, I've got a tube sock, a tube, and this one machine. All right, let's build a rocket. <laughs> That's what you are like, I got small world. That's my tube sock. Pretty much, yeah. So as many, probably most of our viewer, listeners know, small world, it's mostly paper mache kind of Booking dolls. dolls. Yeah. And items, um, a lot of, uh, some of the big Imagineers on this, uh, attraction was Claude Coates. He did a lot of the painting, 
uh, Mark Davis, Mary Blair. I think Mark's wife was on that team, wasn't for the dolls? Yeah, that's Mary Blair. Mary Blair. Okay. Mary Blair. Yep. Mary, Mary Blair. She was. She's probably the reason why this attraction exists. Yeah, she did. She's the designer of the whole art design of the entire attraction. Yeah. Okay. Like she designed the way the children looked, how they were dressed, how the sets were designed. This was probably her baby. This was her baby. Yeah. Absolutely. Her and... Are you going to get to one more? Bob Gurr? Her... No, not Bob Gurr. Rolly Crump. Oh. Hers and Rolly Crump's baby. That was their that was their attraction that they worked on together. Yes. They also had a huge tower. The Tower of the Four Winds. Tower of the Four Winds. Uh, sculpture. Um, it danced and twisted in the breeze. So this was outside of the attraction. Um, that was kind of the big focal point. Of it was it. the weenie. It was to draw you into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> There's a funny st story about that tower. So, when it finally got built, it didn't get built the way they wanted it to. <laughs> so when they built it, Walt was with you know all his executives, and they're all telling Walt, "Oh, it looks amazing! It looks amazing!" Walt goes over to Rolly Crump and he goes, "Tell me, huh? what does it look like?" And he goes, "It looks." Explicit, you know, like, <laughs> it, it looks like something else. And he goes, "Well, better not. We spent so much money on it." So, like, you can tell both Walt and Rolly were not fans of the Tower of the Four Winds, even though like Disney fans today are like, "I wish they saved that thing." <laughs> and so, like, Walt no. Disney, Rolly Crump were like, "That thing looked ugly." He's rolling in his tomb. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Sherman Brothers. Did the classic song "It's a Small World"? Another song that will get stuck in your head. Yes, and uh, uh, they were good at that. They were good at writing songs that got stuck in your head. So oh, the yeah. Sherman Brothers were worried. So they had different versions of the songs they were presenting to Walt, and the Shermans uh, did the the version we all know. And they were worried that it was too simple and too repetitive. And Walt was what? like, "Nope, I like it." <laughs> Move on. There's one of those executive decisions where it's like, nope, we're going for. Well, there's actually a funny story about before they, before the Sherman Brothers were brought on, um, the original plan was that uh, as you go through the ride, you would hear all the children sing their national anthems, oh. and they realized that that sounded absolutely horrible <laughs> because you just hear t all these different voices just singing different things at you and you just had no idea what was going on. And that's when Walt was all like, okay, let me get the Sherman Brothers on this. And that's how they brought them out to the project. Yep. So uh, that's how we've got It's a Small <laughs> World. Now, um, after the fair, the it was a good success. Uh, it's a Small World. They brought it to Disneyland 1966. They did not bring... The sculpture. The tower? No. The, they said they couldn't bring it for some reason, but... I was like, we can't bring it. That's just like two dinosaurs rolled down the road <laughs> behind us. No, nope, can't do it. Nah, it's just like, okay, just can't do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You want to know where that ended up? In the lake. Really? It ended up in the lake. They just blow over into the lake? They just pushed it all into the lake. So, to this day... I don't think, as far as I know, they haven't pulled it out of the lake. It's I'm still sure it's sitting disintegrated there. by it's now. It's probably disintegrated <laughs> by now, but that's, they just, when they demolished the whole World's Fair, it just <laughs> went right into the lake. Yep. So it came to Disneyland. It was then sponsored by Bank of America. And let's see here. Because Coca Cola wouldn't appreciate the Pepsi, Pepsi. sponsored ride. <laughs> uh, fun fact they uh, put a doll holding a red balloon. That is a tribute to Mary Blair. Oh. So when you see the doll holding the red balloon, now you know. I love it. Yeah. That's what I have. Peter? Also, the rides. I know. I, I've got all these random. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You watched a lot of videos. You're you're getting information, you know, that we didn't copy and paste from. So, um, the ride system helped inspire, gave us 
what we know for Pirates of the Caribbean. Boat rides. The boat rides. Oh, what's the yeah. rule? What was the rule? Small world's boats can work in pirates, but pirates' boats can't yeah. work in small world. Yeah. I think that was the rule. I think that's that I how heard. it works, yeah. It's, it's something different. weird like that, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the because before Pirates of the Caribbean was going to be a walkthrough wax museum attraction after the World's Fair and it's a small world happened, they're like, we can just do that for Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, can you imagine Pirates without that nostalgic oh, smell of the water? It probably wouldn't have lost. Oh, no, it would be something else It today. would be something without else. It, it would have been replaced. And we wouldn't have... A walkthrough attraction? How many of those are left? Not many. <laughs> Only in Paris. <laughs> Only in Paris. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, uh, so yeah, that that's in general. I mean, obviously, that's not all the facts, but that's kind of gives us a general idea of the importance of the 1964-65 World's Fair. It's something that we got a lot of key attractions that st are still around today and are cherished by fans around the world, and would and Disney would be in big trouble if they announced that they were getting rid of any of them. In fact, I'm actually going to talk about that on our next episode on um, one of them. Um, These are very stepping stone attractions to greater yes. attractions. These may not be the greatest attractions, but they lead to... I would say it's like a foundation to a wall. To the next thing. step of the Disney attractions that we get in Disneyland. And so this was the events that took place at this World's Fair launched Disney into the new direction. It confirmed to Disney that... Uh, the East Coast can give it can will be successful um, on the East Coast. It gave Walt uh, more connections and uh, more reputation with a lot a lot of these larger companies. Because at the time, Walt Disney was still seen as this animator who made a theme park, not really a big name nice. in terms of constructing something massive like Epcot. The experimental product community of tomorrow. So this gave Walt Disney those connections to push the possibility of accomplishing his main, his final dream that he wanted to do, which was Epcot. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get that, but in its place we have a permanent World's Fair. Well, at least we did. It's a little different now, but um, yeah. So that's what we have for today. Thank you for joining us uh, this week for the Matterhorn Yodelers. You can follow us on Instagram. You can follow us on our Facebook. You can email us at MatterhornYodelers at gmail.com. Do we get any creepy voice messages on Anchor yet? <laughs> no creepy voice messages <laughs> yet, but you can send us a voice message. You could be the first. You can. Please. I challenge you, listeners, to be the first. Don't be explicit. <laughs> Just be creepy, all right? Yeah. Like Haunted Mansion creepy, all right? You can send us a message on Anchor. So you just click on one of our links on uh, our social media pages. It will bring us bring you to our Anchor page where you can uh, go ahead and send us a message or record a message. We love to hear your voice. We would. Well, thank you once again. And... Auf Wiedersehen! Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of the Matterhorn Yodelers. Please remember, before your bobsled comes to a complete stop, to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And remember... There's a great big beautiful tomorrow Just a dream away Well, sounds pretty good. In fact, that's just the right spirit.